And I'd like to introduce now Sam Jacob, whose presentation is sponsored by Allco Waterproofing Solutions, who have also provided the stress balls that you've just lifted up from your seats. Every architect should have one. Um, Sam Jacob. Sam is, has built an imaginative and multifaceted architectural career. He's the principal of the London-based practice Sam Jacob Studio and was a founding director of the celebrated and perhaps rather notorious firm FAT, Fashion Architecture Taste, which closed last year in, as someone put it, a blaze of high-profile projects. One of them was the Clockwork Jerusalem, the British exhibition at the Venice Architecture Biennale, which Sam co-curated. His projects have also been exhibited at the VNA in London and the MAK in Vienna. Sam's design portfolio includes retail projects for Selfridges, institutional design for the BBC, and residential design for Manchester City Council. As well as doing and curating architecture, Sam writes about architecture and teaches at Yale, UIC in Chicago, and the Architectural Association in London. Um, what I especially like about Sam is his serious approach to the fun that can be had in architecture. He seems to be open to all possibilities. And I like his self-declared mission to use design as a form of real-life science fiction, to invent new ways of being in the world or new, wor new kinds of worlds to be in. Sam Jacob. Hi, hi, hi. Um, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Um, okay, slides up, fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this kind of strange career that I've made, which is, I guess, a sort of ricochet career between uh, writing, teaching, practicing, things to do with architecture, I suppose. Um, and I'm gonna show a lot of the projects which we've done over the last 20 odd years at, at FAT, which, uh, yeah, we have almost closed. We've been trying to close it for quite a while now, but you know how projects drag on. Um, uh, but it's also a kind of uh, a, a personal story, really. It's also about like how th ways of thinking about architecture, ways of making architecture can, uh, I guess, explore what architecture actually is, how it reaches out into the wider world, how it can riff off other uh, forms of cultural production, other kinds of media, film, music, literature, fine art, and so on, but also delve deeply into really foundational disciplinary ideas. Um, and, and with that in mind, I was really fascinated, uh, you know, as someone from uh, uh, a long way away, uh, with the last panel discussion about identity culture and, um, and architecture as a medium through which those kinds of ideas might be explored and might be addressed. And of course, I guess, of course, here in New Zealand, that has a very specific narrative, but I think the same is true of architecture everywhere. You know, you could think of a phrase uh, like that, uh, which uh, Charles Rennie Mackintosh uh, said, that architecture is the history of a nation written in stone. And, I'm not sure I totally agree with the entire sentiment of that, and I think I might rephrase it, that architecture is a way of writing narratives, not necessarily national narratives and not necessarily historical narratives, into stone or concrete or glass or whatever. And that's in, in part what I want to talk about. The, the talk is called Make It Real. And the title comes from a small book uh, published by the Strelka Press, which is a Russian uh, imprint attached to the Skrtstraka school, hence the Cyrillic. Um, and it's, it's uh, a book which tries to argue that, of course, architecture is a very real thing. You can't argue with the fact of architecture. You know, you can bang your head on it, stub your toe on it. It's real in that sense. Um, but it's also something which springs from the imagination. Um, and in, in that way, it's imagination made real. Uh, that means maybe that we could also think of architecture as a sort of real fiction, 
or as a fictional reality, that the kind of interchange between imagination, stories, and the physical fact of buildings, of cities, I think is, is much closer than we might think. And this is a quote from Jay-Z, which I think talks directly to this idea. He's saying here of how things can be spoken into existence, that you can talk things into a reality. And for me, that's the really exciting position that architecture has, that it's exactly at that fulcrum, the kind of portal between the imaginary, uh, and I mean the imaginary not just in the visionary sense, not just in the aesthetic sense, but in all senses of the imaginary, the conceptual world of humanity, that's to say political, economic, legal, social, and so on, all of these settlements that, that architecture manifests, that kind of precipitates into the world. And springing from that, I would say architecture has two real tasks. One is this job, as Jay-Z says, of speaking things into existence through its material form. But I'd also argue that it should speak of the way that it speaks things into existence. That it's a duty for architecture to kind of report on the fact that it is partly fictional, that it's not entirely real, that it's something we can argue with, it's something we can change, it's something we can make into forms that we want it to take. That's not my soundtrack, by the way. The ominous hum. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about an origin myth of architecture. Where does architecture come from? And it, this is, in a sense, I guess, a tribal gathering of architecture. And it's the kind of place that we should talk about origin myths. And this is the, 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 the myth that um, Vitruvius uh, writes about the origin of the, the column. And he talks about, really, the idea that a column is a representation of a tree. He talks about the, the idea that, that really in some kind of primitive hinterland that you know, we just took a tree and used that to prop up a roof. But at a certain point, we kind of remake that through technology, through culture, uh, into the language of architecture, a column. Um, and I think it's an interesting thing to think about. On the one hand, what he's arguing is that there's a kind of golden thread that takes us all the way back through architecture, all the way back to a pre-architectural state. But at the same time, it's an entirely unnatural thing to do, to make up this origin myth. So it's, on the one hand, claiming a kind of connection to, 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 to nature, kind of legitimacy, but at the same time, a completely contemporary story. Um, and I think origin myths are important in relation to architecture, however fictional they may be. Um, and they're stories that we can tell about where architecture comes from, but they're stories, when we tell those kinds of stories, we're also describing what architecture might become. Um, so this idea of the, the reenactment, the way that architecture retells its own origin myths, is something we can trace here. So you see uh, a very early uh, Greek temple built from wood. And here you see its later incarnation carved from stone. And the story goes that there's this kind of weird transubstantiation of materiality, that the wood becomes stone, that the stone is carved in the way that you know, traditional wood construction uh, would have taken, so that, in a sense, the stone is a representation of a wooden structure. So you can see already, you know, right back at the origins of of Western architecture, there is this kind of uh, relationship between architecture being something, really being something, but also talking about being something as well, a thing which is both a building, but a building about a building as well. Um, and as we, you know, if we, if we look through history, we can see this kind of repetition, this, this reuse of, uh, of history, the way that history is folded into uh, contemporary manifestations of architecture. So here you see a moment in the Grand Tour with 
you know, the, the, the English aristocracy raiding the ancient classical world. Here they are measuring uh, a, a gigantic Corinthian column and producing books like this, this Antiquities of Athens by Stuart and Revit. Um, and this was a kind of pattern book, essentially. This is like how you could learn how to do classical architecture. And it was through uh, drawings and books like this, but also through artifacts, that uh, a new kind of Italianate style spread beyond uh, its, its original regional uh, location. And so these drawings became the means by which classicism was disseminated, and it you know, fell into the hands of people like Wren and Hawksmoor and Vanbrugh, and became reinterpreted, in one case, by the, you know, as the, the, the English Baroque, Baroque, which is a strange rereading of the Renaissance, which is also a strange rereading of the classical world. So you can see here the sort of ways in which architecture is retelling its own story. Um, and as it retells something, it both refers way, way back, but also creates something utterly new, as in the case of uh, Wren's St. Paul's. So there's this idea, I think, maybe of reenactment, which is embedded in architecture. Architecture is always remaking itself, but it's not an academic, or uh, it, it has no fidelity to history itself. And it's not, certainly not as neat as uh, a kind of uh, 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 a sectioned off piece of time. Instead, it's a kind of chaos. And here we can see a lot of different reenactments happening all at the same time in a way that it was historically impossible. But perhaps this is a truer image of the idea of reenactment in architecture. At the same time, if you think back to the, the column and the tree, that maybe the, the column is a model of the tree, or maybe uh, the, the, the Greek stone temple is a model of the wooden temple. Perhaps all architecture is a model of itself, a kind of reenactment of its own entity. Um, and here, a little sketch I did in the hotel room the other night when I couldn't sleep or woke up too early, the, the architects regarding the model, being regarded themselves, regarding themselves inside another model. Um, and maybe this is what architecture might be. Uh, maybe architecture is a one-to-one -one model of the world where we can't quite tell where its representational qualities and where its real qualities begin and end. Maybe it's real and fictional at the same time. At the same time, well, of course, all of this idea of reenactment brings me onto the notion of the copy, which has been a very important topic for me, for FAT, um, and I guess a sort of challenge to uh, uh, a sort of disciplinary, core disciplinary ideas. Um, you could think of the copy in architecture as the complete anathema to the, the profession's idea of itself now that prizes you know, myths of individual genius and originality. But of course, the copy is also deeply embedded in architectural culture. And it's also embedded in the physical way that we actually work. You know, co copy, paste, copy, paste, duplicate array, all of these kinds of copying uh, 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 kind of tools we do, you know, like second nature, we don't even think about it. So on the one hand, the copy is a kind of threat to these notions of originality in architecture. It's perceived as something which is glib, which is simply a, a surface or a sterile dead end. On the other hand, there's an idea of a copy as something which is incredibly fertile, an incredibly productive act, which we see in objects like this. This is a, thing, uh, a phenomenon called curfs which uh, is an acronym which stands for Keeping It Real Fakes. God knows quite what that is supposed to mean. But it's a phenomenon where essentially you get knockoffs of products, but the knockoff's actually better than the thing it's knocking off. The, the, the fake or the copy is an improvement on the original. But here's another example. A, a totally boring uh, kind of uh, uh, luxury development outside of Shanghai um, called Thamestown. <clears throat> 
styled like an English village. Uh, and you can see, I would agree, yes, not all copies are, are interesting. And certainly on the surface, this is shallow. This is you know, everything that copies are, are, are kind of accused of. But, but, but this is what lurks below that thin veneer that applied over the top of it, something entirely strange, something entirely original, something entirely inventive, a kind of brutalist vernacular, which existed probably in the world for like, I don't know, a couple of weeks before it was smoothed out into something far more ordinary. So the method of manufacture here is at odds with the image that it creates. Um, and this is, I suppose, a reverse engineered kind of architecture. You know what you want to create, but you don't know quite how to make it, or you haven't got the right tools to, 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 to create it. And it's a project, it's a kind of idea we took to um, uh, the Venice Biennale. We were actually close neighbors to uh, John, John and Sheila. We were both tasked with uh, responding to the theme of common ground, which was Dave, David Chipperfield, the director's title for the show. And we thought, well, maybe the, the idea of a copy is a, a, a way of, I guess, the foundation of, of, of a certain kind of commonality that we have as architects. It's the foundation of language. There's an amazing um, Barbara Kruger uh, image with a, a picture of a baby at uh, her mother's breast and across it in Barbara Kruger style, it says we were obliged to steal language. And in some senses, this idea of appropriation and copying, I think, is a foundation of how we create language, both you know, verbal but also architecturally. Um, and we looked at what we described as the sort of uh, example of the architectural copy, the Villa Rotunda, um, a building which itself is made out of copying things, essentially. It's a kind of a brand new typology made from smashing together old uh, 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 typo typologies um, in plan and in elevation and in section. It also copies itself with its bilateral symmetry. Uh, and it has been copied many, many times. And here's just some of the family tree of the, the, well, the very strange family tree of the Villa Rotunda across time and space, built for different reasons in different places by different people. Here they are all on top of one another. And, and here, here they are. This is the original. This is uh, uh, Chiswick House by Lord Burlington, the sort of beginning of the English Baroque a version of the Villa Rotunda, Monticello, Thomas Jefferson, and here, one of the most recent, uh, which is built by someone billed as the richest Palestinian in Nablus in the uh, Palestinian territories. So uh, uh, an incredibly accurate version of the Villa Rotunda. And, and I think here we can understand another important aspect of the idea of the copy, like the fact that this is built in a very contested political territory I think is important. The fact that you build this icon of Western civilization in that zone where bulldozers and construction of houses uh, is an incredibly uh, uh, loaded issue, I think is important. That the act of copying might not be to do with the object itself, but might be to do with other narratives that, that, that leak into the object due to the reason it com it's come into the world. And many other copies on Google Warehouse. Uh, some of them good, some of them not so good, some of them detailed. And we took this one. So this is an important act as well, that we would not design anything. We would simply download a shareware model and use this as the foundation of a, how to showcase you know, yourself as an architect is like just download a model off, uh, off the internet which led to this project, the Villa Rotunda Redux, which was really about displaying the act of copying as a very visceral thing, that its process would also be its concept. And the process was to do with molds and casts, an architectural size mold and an architectural size cast, which would respond to the Villa Rotunda's own bilateral symmetry that we'd only make a quarter of it. And this is how it would work. Mold, sprayed into the mold, 
the cast revealed, and then the cast and the mold shown together, which would in turn give you all of these different kinds of conditions. The inside of the mold, which would be a negative of the outside of the Villa Rotunda, the perfect cast, the positive cast, the inside of the cast, the kind of record of the actual application of material into the mold, and the outside of the mold itself, a kind of the, the, the armature which enables the whole thing to happen. And as it does this, it begins to play with the idea of symmetry. What happens when things cross the line? As you think of a sort of uh, 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 what we call a, a kind of black mirror, that the thing on the other side of the mirror would not be the same as the thing it was reflecting, so that the positive would become negative. You can see here in section and in plan that positive becomes negative, inside becomes outside, and so on, and so on. But it was also about the transmission, the literal transmission of information from one state to another. So from a digital file to the mold construction, the ways in which an ionic capital would have to be made uh, in order to get it out of the mold. Um, then I suppose the transmission from the negative mold to the positive cast and all of that displayed as a record. So the thing itself is a record of its own construction. You can see it here, positive, negative, inside and outside, gloop and non-gloop, armature and you know, uh, uh, resolution, uh, all kind of made at this scale where you could actually get inside it. So I think that the act of mold making usually happening at a smaller scale now becomes architecturalized, one might say. So at, at, at the same time, if that's, a very, that, that's really to do with the idea of trying to reproduce one thing, and from that one thing, many things emerging. A lot of uh, the, uh, uh, I guess, an another way that, that we've approached this idea is the idea of uh, collage, the idea of taking recognizable things from very many sources and reassembling them to make something new. And I suppose this uh, uh, first uh, came to light in a project for an advertising agency in uh, Amsterdam who had an ama amazing place. It was a, a, a secret church, so behind a normal domestic door in a street in Amsterdam, you walked into this incredible space, a uh, historical monument, so you couldn't really touch any of the fabric. And we developed a strategy which was you know, big bits of furniture or, or small buildings. Each of these took on uh, a language all of its own. You can see some examples here, which we would fax over to the client, and they would say, no, there's no way we're an aircraft carrier. Yes, we are uh, Arc de Triomphe, um, which was the, essentially the design process. But each of these things was an incongruous element, which, though, I guess, intensely familiar, a piece of garden shared, a patch of football pitch, a Wild West fort, in their assemblage become something different um, that develops a kind of surreal narrative through the relationship between these fixed points. Which essentially is the same strategy here. This is a housing project in a place in the north of England, Middle, Middlesbrough. And it came with a very kind of straightforward uh, developer brief but the brief talked about community, it talked about different kinds of uh, lifestyle, and we thought, well, we'll just take that idea incredibly literally and begin to take, I guess, existing models and stick them together in a way which is fairly incongruous. So to sort of take the, uh, 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 a logical approach to the, to the brief, but each step that you take using that logic takes you further away from any kind of rational idea of composition. So you can see it here. It's a, an apartment block which sits on top of a Swiss chalet, which then grows a suburban street on its roof, and then gets eroded by a garden which fills the center of the space. Here it is in section. So from one angle, from a distance, apartment block, suddenly revealing itself propped up on a squashed Swiss chalet, 
And there, the strange Cape Cod uh, uh, suburban houses sitting on its roof scape. So here, again, the, 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 the design, one might say, is more to do with the way in which elements are chosen and the way in which they're then composed rather than in the invention of those pieces themselves. Another important idea, I think, has been this idea of, I suppose, transubstantiation or, or kind of alchem alchemical attitude to, to materials. So just as the column in, in Vitruvius's story of the column, the column can change from a living biological entity of the tree and it can become carved into stone. Perhaps there's other ways in which we can transform the meaning and narratives of things themselves through material. Perhaps material too is a language. So to that uh, end, a stool featuring um, a cast of uh, Hercules's head apart from it's cast in foam, so that when you sit on this demigod's face, it gives way, becomes incredibly comfortable, distorts into monstrous form, but also in an unexpected way. The, the foam that it's cast in, this like poly polyurethane foam, has weirdly and accidentally the appearance of stone. So this is sort of, I guess, a, a, a kind of, a, 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 unexpected in the nature of the performance of the material, but we could also suggest that the meaning change, if you take a, something which is supposed to be as fixed and as significant as Hercules's head, an image of the classical world, which suddenly becomes remade in a material which gives way, which de deforms, perhaps that begins to suggest a sort of more doubtful relationship to form itself, or in an opposite sense, a basketball made out of clay, where the thing you expect to bounce becomes brittle. Now, um, I talked about reenactments, but I think enactment is, an, is another way we could think of, of architecture. Um, uh, another way in which it takes the imaginary world, the conceptual world, and makes it real. Uh, now, we could think of enactment in a number of ways. First of all, we could think of it as a theatrical thing. And here you can see uh, a script. And in the script, the uh, playwright provides the words, but also provides some direction. Flourish, for example. Excellent, all but Hamlet. So the stage directions embedded in the text. Um, and then there's the, the actor who takes the script and performs it. And uh, using, I guess, voice, gesture, costume, um, performs the script, enacts the script. And we could think of architecture performing in that theatrical sense as a kind of actor. But the other meaning of enactment is it, the moment where uh, uh, something becomes a piece of real law becomes a live piece of legislation. It moves from being a collection of words, an idea, a suggestion, to something which is a much more fixed part of the way in which we are allowed or not allowed to, to live. And so here is the enacting clause in, in British law. This is the, the thing which gets attached to something once it's become law. This makes it the law essentially. And in that sense, it's an, when an idea becomes real. And I think this is also what architecture does, even at a very basic level. You could think of the way in which this room is set up as a, is a form of enactment that here I am on the stage and there you are in the audience, which already sets up a certain kind of reality of a social relationship within this space itself. Now, I want to show, I guess, two versions of this relationship between, or architectural relationship between the real and the fictional. And in a sense, they're two sides of the same coin. They might possibly be uh, 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 co completely opposite. Uh, I'm not sure I've quite come to terms with it. They're two projects which really bookend Fat's architectural career. The first real building and the last building too. First of all, this one, 
uh, known as the Blue House in East London, uh, a, a small building with a house and an office and an apartment in it. And it's a building which really wants to tell you that it's about being an office and a house. But it wants to tell you in a way which is to do with its communicational quality. So you see here, it really wanting to become a billboard. You know, it's like this thick. It's really advertising the fact that you could not live within the depth of its elevation, within its communicational, let's say, uh, 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 zone. But as that facade turns around, it becomes more three-dimensional. It becomes more like a, a theatrical set, and it performs a series of different things. It performs the image of house, but it also performs streetscape and garden and, uh, and so on. But within that, something very different happens. So the sort of spatial organization that happens behind that very two-dimensional exterior is incredibly rich. And you can see here in, in section the ways that uh, staircases wind around what are essentially small buildings that sit within the fabric of the, uh, of the house. And you can see how the interior is kind of staged with these kinds of, I guess, broken up pieces of uh, domestic architecture as though they've been kind of cut out of uh, various um, scrapbooks and reassembled. So within the spaces between the two-dimensional and the kind of three-dimensional, there are gaps through which staircases run, through which platforms emerge. And then there's also dialogue between the two. So in, in this room, we are inside the small office block, but it's a bedroom. So you have three windows. And it's a little bit like that moment in, I guess, if you walk up the Statue of Liberty, and from the outside, it has this obvious figural uh, uh, um, representation. But on the inside, you're inside her, her crown, and her crown becomes a series of windows. And so this kind of weird relationship between its representational quality outside and its interior world. I think this is exactly the kind of dialogue which is occurring here. So in this project, the house is advertising itself as a real thing. It's not talking about things which are unusual. It's talking about the things which it actually is, a home and an office. Um, but it does it in a way which advertises its fictional quality. It's over-representational, in, in a sense. Now, th this uh, is an inversion of that. It's the fictional made real, and it's a, uh, another house, or in some sense, a house, designed it in uh, collaboration with Grayson Perry, the Turner Prize-winning artist. Here's Grayson on a tour of uh, Germany on his uh, uh, customized motorbike with a small mobile chapel on the back with uh, Alan Measles, his muse and uh, sort of miniature deity on, on the back of it. And it's a, a building which is, a, in some senses, a, um, a chapel, but it's a very secular chapel, but it's based on these kinds of roadside, roadside devotional chapels. But it's entirely secular, but it does have an incredibly strong narrative. It's a narrative about Julie, and Julie is someone who's sprung from uh, Grayson's imagination, and she's a kind of Essex every woman. And I'm sure the myths of Essex girls have spread even to these parts. Um, the building itself is a sketch from, from Grayson, is incredibly rich in terms of its narrative content. It, as though it was you know, a, almost like an early religious building, it is telling the story, and it does it through its surfaces. It does it through a series of tiles. Here you can see some test casts of Julie herself, of elements which then become part of the facade, like a half of a C90 uh, uh, mixtape. Look, there you go, yeah. Pieces of uh, the uh, motorbike that she loved to drive. And it sits in the landscape of North Essex, really as a kind of, I guess, well, it will be a home which you can rent. It's uh, part of a series uh, built by Living Architecture. 
but when you rent it, you'll become the custodian of Julie's Chapel. But this, unlike the Blue House, which was dealing with very real things and in a sense fictionalizing them, this takes a fiction, a fiction of Julie, um, a, a, and tries to manifest that in the world. It takes a story and makes it, in this case, in almost entirely ceramic reality. So this, this project's not quite finished. This is why we're still having problems actually closing fat, because you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough thing to do. Um, but whether this is the same idea, this idea that you can f you know, bring a fiction into the world as a built form, or whether you fictionalize the built form, I, I, I'm still not sure whether these are compatible ideas, or whether it's something which is entirely flipped in our kind of um, uh, 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 thinking about how architecture works in the world. But we can be sure that stories do shape things. This is a project about how narrative and function might relate one to the other, how stories might warp even the most practical world of plumbing. And it was a, for, built for an exhibition uh, about British celebrities. The celebrities we were given were uh, David and Victoria Beckham. Obviously a couple incredibly in love. I think this was just after uh, David had had a series of affairs and so they were very uh, publicly in love. Um, but it was also a story about, I suppose, uh, uh, an idea of function. And function is a sort of abstract uh, idea or, or function as a narrative idea. So if you think of the bathroom, you think of bathrooms as a sort of uh, you know, the, the front line of modernism in a sense, the place where the wars against uh, of, of hygiene, of light and space were perhaps first fought. Um, but here a different agenda is at work and a different agenda is forcing these uh, uh, faucets into uh, new forms of relationship. So it's for a couple who cannot bear to be apart. A couple who have one gigantic basin, have two baths that have been cut and spliced together to form a heart shape in plan, where the showers begin to wrap around each other like the Welsh love spoon. But, of course, as this incessant, claustrophobic idea of romantic love <laughs> evolves, we find it producing... So, the, I mean, the question, obviously, that we're asking here is, are there narratives, cultural narratives, embedded in things which are seemingly as objective as plumbing? And if there are, could we rewrite them? And underlying all of these is an idea, really, of architecture as information. Architecture is a very communicative, architecture is almost a kind of form of media, one might say. Here, a sculpture which very directly works with that idea, a, a archetypal house built out of neon, of course, neon being the, the material most associated with signage and communication. So it's arguing here as a house, not as a machine for living in, but as information for living in. And if we think about architecture's relationship to information, to communication, even to, to broadcast, I think it begins to explain the approaches to, to this project, which was for new uh, studios for um, the BBC in Cardiff, what they call the Drama Production Village, uh, which is, on the one hand, part of the devolution of the BBC from London out to the region. So a big chunk moved to Manchester, a big chunk of production moved to Wales. It's where Doctor Who is now filmed, um, but also uh, the Welsh language soap opera, Publicum, People of the Valley. Uh, recommend that if you're a big fan of uh, uh, people drinking champagne in car showrooms, which seems to be the, the main event in Publicum every week. Um, but it's a it's TV it's TV studio, so it's a black box. You know, the ideal TV studio is something which you can't see into, is is not affected by uh, the time of day, not affected by season, 
But at the same time, this was a project which was very important in terms of the regeneration of Cardiff. It was the anchor for the regeneration of the old docks. So it needed to be shed, but it also couldn't be shed. So of course, inevitably, we were hired as the kind of closest thing uh, someone would get to Robert Venturi uh, in, um, in uh, working distance of Cardiff. Obviously, a direct decorated shed, but it's a shed which uses decoration, I guess, as a form of mediation between the fictions which exist within it, these fictions of alien worlds or, or uh, 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 social interaction, hospital dramas, all of these kinds of things which you would never see physically being made but are beamed right into your home. Here they become actually expressed within the facade of the building. So the, the, the building begins to communicate some of the content, at least, of, of what's happening within it. So you can see here this kind of space Baroque entrance or the ways in which uh, symbols of uh, um, uh, hospital dramas uh, mixed with references to Victorian uh, architecture in, in Cardiff to build this essentially narrative screen, which is referencing the science fiction design of the Daleks and the Cybermen. So that it becomes, I guess, a, a, a symbol of the things which are happening inside it. It's been nicknamed in Cardiff the uh, uh, Taf Mahal, which I think is a, a term of endearment I'd like to think about. So in, in that sense, it's, it is a project which deals with this, the, the fictions which happen within it and how that might find architectural form in, or even civic form on its exterior. And perhaps there's ways in which these stories these fictions actually serve a social purpose. In, in that sense, it might be, let's say, more to do with townscape or cityscape. In other cases, it might be to do with making frameworks within which social life can occur. So if architecture is both representation and reality at the same time, both a fiction and a material, spatial embodiment of that fiction all at once, it's a cultural and material construct simultaneously, can it then deploy this representational cultural project as a real political and social project? And that's the thinking behind this project on the outskirts of Rotterdam in a place called Hoefleet, which you can see here, which is a classic post-war new town built to serve this gigantic oil refinery, the biggest in Europe at the time. Originally, we were hired without a project, without a brief, just to respond to it. And what we were looking for, I suppose, were new kinds of origin myths, not the origin of the town in its historical sense, but, but perhaps an imaginative uh, origin myth, or where might its new beginning come from? And we began to find it in things like this, a carriage lamp jacked into the municipal power supply or the way in which apartments were decorated or the dreams of pastoral Dutch landscapes in people's front gardens or the incredibly rich personal narratives which have been created in you know, gardens like this, where you can see a sort of relationship between communication, uh, identity, uh, and the physical expression of those imaginary ideas as we were developing, I guess, a brief through us suggesting things like a, a pet cemetery or a new entrance to the town which might advertise its presence to the highway which took you know, central Rotterdamers to uh, uh, Antwerp, bypassing this uh, uh, um, uh, suburban uh, uh, satellite. But also how things like signs might become useful how they might become a kind of focus for uh, community activities. In a sense, what we were looking for is a, a kind of civic architecture. And I think it's, it's, in a sense, easy to look at civic architecture if we look backwards. So here's uh, uh, San Marco. And we can understand it as a very, you know, an embodiment of a culture, as an expression of the richness of that culture and the way in which architecture communicates that. But it's very hard to imagine how the vernacular of 
hi the highway uh, uh, landscape of hopefully might be able to do the same thing. So this, in a sense, was the, the project. How could we invent a civic language using this kind of generic architecture? And here's a series of studies which look at how narrative and storytelling might work with the most kind of empty and most generic forms of architecture known to man. Also how landscape might do that. And we know, of course, historically, landscape can be an incredibly powerful narrative and storytelling tool. We know it from the picturesque, we know it from Chinese gardens and so on. And it developed into this, which is a cultural center, a community center, and a park, which is basically features a series of objects, some of which are buildings, some of which are benches, lampposts, 